Shabbat Shalom and Shana Tova. What do you think is the most trumpeted story in the news this past year? Not going there, not going there. My vote is for artificial intelligence, AI, and the whole chat GPT craze. If you haven't tried it, it's quite amazing what ChatGPT can do. For example, if you happen to get distracted or fall asleep during this sermon, you can ask ChatGPT to give you a 100-word summary. <laughs> now, the recent breakthroughs in AI is based on enhancements in neural networks, which are basically electronic versions of the human brain. And the way these AI models achieve their remarkable capabilities is by training them on large, actually huge, amounts of data. In fact, all the data in the entire web. And given all this training, the software is able to come up with the right answer, or at least an intelligent response to almost any query. The fascinating part is that these computer software programs are designed to work in the same way as the neurons in our brain. Which leads one to ask, if an intelligent computer that works like our brain needs lots of training to do the right thing, might we also need lots of training to do the right thing? And what happens if we don't receive our proper training? You see, the Torah's philosophy of human nature seems to anticipate the training needs of AI today. The Torah recognizes that left to our own design or human nature, we might not always make the best choices. Right at the beginning in the book of Genesis, the story of Cain and Abel makes that pretty clear. So the Torah guides us and seeks to educate us to choose right and just behaviors so that we may lead a happier and more fulfilling life. Now, what's really interesting is that the traditional Torah readings for Rosh Hashanah are deliberately selected because they are extraordinary examples of moral training. Let's look at these stories for just a moment. In the first day reading for Rosh Hashanah, which Tori Janish just chanted so beautifully, our matriarch, it includes the story of our matriarch Sarah, who becomes jealous of Hagar, her maidservant, and she wor worries about her son Isaac's legacy. So she tells Abraham to cast out Hagar and Ishmael into the wilderness. Perhaps even more memorable is the second day, second day Torah reading for Rosh Hashanah. You may all remember this story, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, a story in which Abraham hears a call from God to sacrifice his beloved son Isaac as a test of his faith and dedication. Now, as difficult and challenging as these stories are, they contain powerful educational messages meant to guide us toward moral behavior. In the first of these stories, which we read today, remember, God intervenes to save Hagar and Ishmael. In fact, the Torah states that God opens Hagar's eyes so that she sees a well which is a life-saving source of sustenance. And similarly, in the story of the Akedah, at the last possible moment, an angel of God intervenes so that Abraham does not sacrifice Isaac. The angel of God helps Abraham see that God does not want child sacrifice as proof of Abraham's dedication. So even though these are ancient stories set in an ancient context. 
the values they teach us are eternally relevant. They teach us. We should take care of the vulnerable in our society, not cast them out. And they teach us we should provide for and protect our children, not sacrifice them for a higher cause. In these stories, God is the voice of moral conscience, and through God's voice, we too see what is right and just. The Torah provides us with training data based on real life stories. And in AI terms, that's called supervised learning. Now, without this moral training, it seems that things can go horribly wrong. In a recent published article in The Atlantic, the writer and columnist David Brooks wrote, about a serious cause for concern in our society. Brooks notices, and perhaps we do also, that our society is becoming more sad, more lonely, and more mean. And in his words, we inhabit a society in which people are no longer trained in how to treat others with kindness and compassion. And according to Brooks, the root cause for this alarming trend is that our society is failing at moral formation. Now, what is moral formation? Brooks defines moral formation as including three things. First, helping people restrain their selfishness. Second, teaching people basic social and ethical skills, and third, helping people find a purpose in life. Now, historically, from the time the United States was founded until about 150 years later, the goal of moral formation was at the forefront of our society. Civic groups, such as the YMCA and the Boys and Girl Scouts, they were founded with moral education as part of their purpose. Now remember, during this time period, most Americans were members of a religious community which taught morality, and a community which taught others concern for others, and a community which inspired a connection to a transcendent being, something greater than ourselves. It seems that the turning point occurred right after World War II. Because let's face it, the 20th century brought forth horrors none of us could have imagined. And as a result, the moral formation camps split into two. Now, some theorists felt that our experience of human depravity should cause us to double down on moral formation in our society. But others argued that the problems of the 20th century had to do with authority and the existence of rigid power structures. So we need to liberate individuals from these power structures. And according to this philosophy, people are naturally good and can be trusted with their self-actualization, free from institutional guidance. And so things evolved, eventually, with the self-actualization camp winning out. And then starting in the 1940s and 50s, schools and educators started focusing more on the SAT scores of their students rather than moral education. And moral instruction in the civic sphere continued to decline. Now, I don't think I have to cite statistics to explain what happens when moral formation is no longer at the forefront of our society, because I think we are experiencing it. People become lonelier, people become sadder, and people become angrier. People feel a lack of meaning in their life, and they turn to politics as the new religion, and in some cases to the extreme, to radicalism, 
to help fill a void in their lives. But it doesn't have to be this way. Because we here today know the antidote for this trend. It's what we came here today to celebrate. And that's our Jewish heritage. I agree. <laughs> In the 21st century, as it has been for multiple millennia, Jewish wisdom serves as our guide for moral formation. Now, since the Enlightenment period, many of us have taken a rationalist point of view towards Judaism and Jewish practice. And some of us may decide these are just ancient laws, ancient practices, and they are no longer relevant to us. But in fact, the moral imperatives that guide our biblical stories remain valid training data for eternity. As an example of the values we learn, in the book of Genesis, God reviews what God has accomplished during the days of creation, and as you may know, God declares it was good. Not finished, but good. And through this story, we see that Torah, and by extension Judaism, views the world as a good place. And if we train ourselves in moral and ethical behavior by following our set of ethical commandments, we have the potential to enjoy life in all its fullness and in all its goodness. Now, as with the artificial intelligence displayed by computers, our behavior is in large part a function of our training, our moral training. The book of Proverbs states it very succinctly. Train up a child in the way one should go, and they will not depart from it when they are old. A sobering statistic for us to consider here today is that all of all the potential non-Orthodox students that could be enrolled in Jewish religious schools studying for B'nai Mitzvah, today, only about 50% are actually enrolled. Now, I'm not saying that enrolling your child in religious school will be the solution to all of society's problems. <laughs> However, it does cause us to wonder if a child doesn't learn about the Ten Commandments in religious school, where are they going to learn about them? And it's not only our youth that can benefit from moral instruction. A famous story, which you may know, is the story of Rabbi Akiva, whose story actually doesn't begin till he was 40 years old, which, let's face it, is almost ancient in first century CE. Now, at the age of 40, it's said that Rabbi Akiva had never studied Torah or Judaism in his life. But one day, he was standing at the mouth of a well, and he happened to notice something. And so he asked, who carved a hole in this stone? And they replied to him, it's from the water that falls on it, day after day, drip after drip. And Rabbi Akiva considered this for a while, and then he said, if something soft can carve something hard, then all the more so, the words of Torah can engrave themselves on my heart. An ancient story, yet relevant to us. Because it seems that our mature hearts can become hardened by the constant barrage of the negative news cycle. And our mature souls can be hardened to the thought of learning how to live a more spiritual life through Judaism. Couldn't we, like Akiva, also benefit from the moral training of our tradition and allow Jewish wisdom to wash over us day by day, drip by drip, so that it may soften our own hearts? Now, a 
lot of ink has been spilled recently by commentators worrying about AI and whether its training is aligned with the interests of humanity. But wouldn't it be great if we all worried just as much about training humanity to be aligned with the interests of humanity? In today's rapidly evolving world, we stand together at the confluence of ancient wisdom and modern marvels. In 5784, let's ensure we continue to train ourselves with the timeless lessons of righteousness, compassion, and justice, so that like our modern machines, we too learn to do the right thing.